It was being in that audience with those 80,000 other kids from my generation that made me realise that discrimination of all kinds was going to be our Vietnam. You, how would you describe yourself as an art activist who does art or as an artistic activist? I think a singer-songwriter activist is what I normally go by. I mean, I think that's, that's a better description of what I do. Um, you know, I'm old enough to remember the, the political songwriters of the 1960s, so I grew up with the idea that music could say something more than just, I'm great, you're shit, you like my socks, to paraphrase Oasis. So, um... <laughs> So I'm, I'm, Ooh, I'm, burn. I'm a, I work in a, uh, in a paradigm that I think suffers from the idea from the 1960s that music can change the world. Because in my experience, it can't. And audiences don't like me telling them this, but I do it very often. I did it yesterday at Bearded Theory for 10,000 people in their field cooking in near Litchfield. Woody Guthrie's guitar never killed any fascists, okay? It's a slogan. It's an idea, and an idea so powerful that we still talk about it 80 years after he painted it on his guitar. Because music doesn't have agency in, in and of itself, but it does have a power. And I speak from experience. I doubt there's anyone in this room who's been trying as hard as I have in the last 40 years to change the world through singing songs. It don't change, you know? Ultimately, what happens is different. And it goes back to double back to um, Victoria Park in 1978 and Rock Against Racism because the lessons that I learned there and the change of perspective that I experienced didn't actually come from the stage because what happened was when I got there there were 80,000 kids just like me in that park and I realized I was not the only one who cared about this issue at the time I worked with a bunch of guys I worked in a merchant bank I was a bank messenger I worked with a a milieu of guys who were casually racist, sexist, or homophobic, and I used to nod and smile, you know, while feeling a bit awkward. But after seeing all those kids in the park there, when I went back to work on Monday morning, I didn't do that anymore. I just gave them a stony stare or just walked away. So the thing is that you've got to understand here that although my perspective was changed irrevocably by that event, it wasn't the clash that changed my perspective. It was being in that audience with those 80,000 other kids from my generation that made me realize that discrimination of all kinds was going to be our Vietnam. It was going to be our CND, the previous generations that had an issue which they coalesced around. It was going to be discrimination for us. We were going to be the generation of rock against racism, two-tone, artists against apartheid, uh, you know, fighting the fascists. That, that, was, that was what we were going to do. And that, that came really from realizing that you know I was not alone that's what gave me the courage of my convictions and you know as I say that's what I think of when I'm doing gigs I'm trying to give the audience that sensibility that they're not alone and I have a song called sexuality which I wrote as a song of gay allyship in the 1990s going for a beer of a gay man is not quite so radical these days so I tweaked it a little bit now so it's now a song of allyship with the trans and non-binary community. And I need to lean into my audience a little bit because geezers my age, I have a little bit of trouble with that issue. And I need to lean into that a little bit. So I make a pitch for that and everyone warmly supports that. And sort of, you know, it's kind of a lovely sort of warm feeling. But afterwards, as I came off stage, a trans kid came up to me and said, listen, thanks for that, mate. A, I don't expect it from an old geezer like you. And two, it's the first time all weekend I've felt seen. And that, to be able to get an audience to articulate that and impart that to a kid, that solidarity to that kid, that's how music makes a difference. That's how music does things. It cannot change the world, but it can make you believe that the world can be changed. And that's probably my philosophy if we're not messing around and making jokes. That's probably it. So when you're writing your music, have you got a kind of clear message that you're trying to impart from the outset? Yeah. And what is at the front line of your mind these days when you're writing? Yeah, the message, the message that I, I put into my music uh, is the same message that I have put into my music since back in 1983, which is buy my record. <laughs> That's the only answer you can that's give. That's also Miriam, important. That's the only to be answer fair. you can give to that question. To be I'm fair, afraid. that is because also what important. Because basically, like any any art, the only forgive me if there's any artists here, but forgive me, the only real justification for making any art, even a podcast, is to articulate and offer a perspective that 
isn't seen somewhere else. You've got your own, it might be the perspective of a bowl of fruit. You might be Van Gogh and you're like, bada boom, bada bam, I see it like this. That's art, right? So it's not about a list of things that I'm, you know, it's them off and write about. It's something comes up and I'm like, this is bugging me. This is really bugging me, you know. And I'm trying to deal with it. I'm trying to do it. And find, suddenly I find a way of articulating it in an interesting way that sort of puts across what I'm trying to say in a positive way. As a progressive, I try to be a glass half full person. I believe that the biggest enemy of all of us who want to make the world a better place is not capitalism or conservatism, it's actually cynicism is our biggest enemy. And not the cynicism of the Daily Mail and Rupert Murdoch. That, you know, they promote cynicism. They want you to believe no one gives a shit. They want you to believe you're on your own. The cynicism I'm talking about is, for those of us who want to make the world a better place, is our own cynicism. Our own sense that nothing will ever change our own feeling that none of this is going to make any difference. My job is to bring people together and make them express that will to make a better word. I, almost, I finished my set yesterday with a song called There's Power in the Union, talked a little bit about the strikes. Put my fist in the air at the way, probably after people there put their fists in the air. Now, I'm in another place now. I'm at another festival doing this. But those people, they're going to go to work on Tuesday morning. They might be in an environment where they feel that their views are marginalised, they don't feel respected. Might be school, might be home, might be work. But they're going to know that there's a field full of people in Staffordshire who do give a shit about this stuff, that they're not, like that trans kid. They feel seen. And that's, that's the power of music again, the solidarity in song. And this is all song, by the way, not just political song. There's a, an emotional solidarity in all song, but it's manifesting that. When I come off stage, my activism is recharged, you know what I mean? I'm fired up when I see all those people put their fists in the air. I'm trying to get the punters to go home feeling the same way. I want them to go home with their activism chart, recharge, you know? And that's probably, the, that's probably the upper limit of what art can do. To imagine it can go beyond that, you've got to be Bono or someone else like that, you know, who's, who's willing to go and talk to George Bush and those kind of people. Not everyone gets that opportunity, not everyone's willing to do that. But it's really, you know, the bottom line, I know it's a, a, a nose to have to remind you of this, but the only real people in this equation that have the ability to change the world is the audience. Always was, always will be. Sorry to lay that shit on you, brothers and sisters and siblings, but that's the truth. So when your audience members go home charged with the power of the music, what are you hoping that they do with that charge at our current political juncture? Because you talked about cynicism and I do think that a lot of the cynicism maybe comes from uh, a lack of hope in terms of political leadership in terms of anyone credible offering alternative visions a disillusionment with yeah, yeah. political ideology so what what are we doing with the charge it's a tough one to, to, to talk about really Miriam I was involved in something in the 1980s called Red Wedge where we were uh, came together after the miners strike to try and defeat Margaret Thatcher's Tories at the uh, Oh, God. I walked past Malcolm Rifkind earlier. It gave me a shudder. <laughs> really did. Whoa. Like the ghost of Christmas past, he was going by. Anyway, no offence to any Tories in the room. But the um, point I want to make is, it's, you know, people always say to me, you know, did Red Wedge work? He didn't win the election. You can't actually ma measure the effect on it. And you, it's no point in trying, you know, what can I do? Go follow them home and shout for their letterbox. You're not doing it right. It, you know, no, it, but you if, can't. if they could hear you, what would it be? You know, what would you hope people might do with it? If I had to paint something on my guitar? Yeah. Death to cynicism. That can be my philosophy as well, yeah. if you want to put that on a T-shirt. I mean, really, I think so. We really do need, you know, you want people to engage, you know, and, and it's tough. I find it tough. But like I said, I'm in a really privileged position because when I feel sort of frustrated or, or, or despair, about something, I write a song about it, come out here in the dark with you lot, play it, everyone claps, and I don't feel half so bad, you know. But that's, it's like therapy. Maybe I should pay you, I don't know. But, but my point is that I, I know that's working for me. I'm trying to get the audience to feel that. I can't, you know, it's like the yoga tent. You can show people the moves, but you can't make them do that every day and, and make them, they've got to take that away themselves and discipline themselves to do that. So what happened with Rock Against Racism was I didn't take away a series of a form of how to do it, but I, I came away with a different perspective and a realisation of why I was different from those guys. And that was enough for me. That was enough for me to find my space and find my people uh, and be part of something bigger. 
So I don't think you can be prescriptive with it. You can just throw out ideas, you know. I'm an old geezer, I stand for trans rights. That's a radical thing in a rock crowd. It's just most majority of them are my age. So I want them to take away and think, well, what did Braggy say? Because what happened, a woman come to me and said, you know that song where you go for a drink with a gay man? It's not very radical anymore, is it? And I went away and thought, yeah, you're, you're right, actually. I really need to think about that and get my, you know, the, the, the solidarity that I had in the, you know, during the Section 28 years with the gays and lesbians. It's exactly the same issue. It's almost, you know, they're even using the same tropes, toilets and kids, you know, it's exactly the same thing. And the, the, the 30 year old me who stood with gays and lesbians during the, the, the AIDS pandemic and Section 28 would be shamed if I sat on the fence now that there's a new generation whose uh, uh, identity and whose uh, uh, right to be themselves on their own terms is being disparaged. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.